Hey there, welcome to the How to Succeed podcast. This is How to Succeed at a Startup with Jason Kelligan, a Sandler trainer from San Francisco. As always, the podcast is brought to you by Sandler, the worldwide leader in sales management and customer service training. You can find more information at sandler.com. That's real easy. We made it simple for you. I'm Mike Montague, your uh, host. And if you have any suggestions for future topics, future guests, uh, things you want to learn how to succeed at, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Mike.Montague at Sandler.com as well. Uh, I'm really excited to jump into it. We're going to talk about how you succeed at a startup here with Jason Kelligan. All right, Jason, uh, this is a big topic. So tell us about succeeding in startup and what we have in store for us today. Yeah, sure. So I spent 10 years at startups, ranging from zero revenue to 15 million. And as I was looking at, you know, the successful startups I was at and some of the not so successful startups, um, noticed a few things. So three things that I want to talk about with you today, which is critical if you want to be successful as a startup or any small business. One is you got to nail your hiring. Two is you got to build an outstanding sales process. And three, you need to have a plan to train and build the skills of your salespeople so they can replicate the success of the founding team. So that's what I want to focus on today. I love that. Now, when you talk about the different range of, of startups, I think something comes to mind uh, first for me, which is if you're hiring salespeople, I'm assuming this isn't the startup like I bought myself a job. I, I bought an HVAC company. I just need to sell enough business to keep me busy. We're talking about a startup that wants to scale and get to some significant revenue of a million or over. But can you talk to us a little bit about what different types of startups look like? Yeah. So I come from the traditional tech startup world, which, you In know, San I'm out Francisco, there, they do that. I know, I know right? <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> you know, so you have a founder, you have some money behind you, you try to build as quickly as possible. But I also think these concepts apply if you're, you know, take your HVAC owner example, where you're doing all the sales, you're also doing all the delivery, you're doing everything. And you want to scale. Well, if you want to scale, it's the same formula as a startup. You need to hire the right people. You need to build sales processes. You need to figure out ongoing training. So I think this applies for basically anybody who is looking to go from, you know, one person themselves to any type of sales team. Yeah. And, and talk to us about the, the stages here, because I think there is some different challenges from early, mid and late stage startup, uh, specifically with the funding and the, the hiring processes and, and stuff. What are some of those differences? Yeah. So if you're if you're in the one to three million, and again, I'm kind of using the traditional startup um, metrics that we use in San Francisco. This could be less depending on your industry. It could be more depending on your industry. Um, but if you're early on, like hiring becomes even more critical than later on. Hiring is always going to be important and want to share some insights on how to make the right hires if you're a startup. But the reason why is this, uh, Mike, we're, we're were you good at science in high school? I actually was. Yes, yeah, science knowledge yeah. world champion. Okay, so the scientific method, you you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. So if you're an owner or a founder in a startup, it's a bit like a science experiment. And correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the biggest, one of the most important keys to a science experiment is controlling your variables. Mm. Right? Yeah, so I like because if, if four or five things go or happen differently each time, you'll never be able to figure out what is the cause and what's the effect. So when you're a startup, what you want to solve for, your first experiment, is how to take your product to market. Um, how to sell it. Will people buy? Why will they buy? Um, what hooks them? And the variable that you don't want to interfere with that is, do I have a good sales team? Because the last thing you want to do six, nine, 12 months from, from when you make your first hire is to look back and say, sales aren't exactly what they should be. Is it because we don't have a good product? Are we in the wrong market? Or is my sales team kind of weak? So if you nail your, your first two sales hires, you can eliminate that variable and solve for the other, other issues that are going to be more strategic to your business. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really smart because I feel like a lot of startups end up in that bucket. I've talked to a lot of people and they're like, well, 
something is wrong, right? It's either our team or our product or something, but or our messaging and marketing, but they don't know what. I think that's a really common early challenge. Um, anything else you think of? And like, I'm thinking of our attitude bucket here, common no. myths or misconceptions. You nailed it for early stage ones. Any other come to, to mind for where people mess up their, their startups? Well, I think uh, I think there's a few attitudes, and and again, it, it goes back to hiring. But it's a belief that when they hire salespeople, they get a little bit too. What's the right word? They they, they fall in love with a resume and and not the mm, person, right? And they they over index on big company experience or competitor experience. And so, in a startup, the attitude that you need to have is that I, we're the underdog. Right, mm -hmm. um, like you're going out because you believe that you could do something better than probably a more established company in the marketplace can. So that underdog attitude, that underdog mentality, needs to be a core component of your culture and a core component of uh, of who you hire. So a technique when I'm hiring is that. Um, to, this is a technique I use when I'm hiring to find the right attitude in my salespeople, which is that I look for somebody who actually the product they sold previous to joining my company is harder to sell than what I'm selling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Yes. You want to go uh, down, not up. So if you're selling like a real easy commodity, something everybody needs and wants, and you know, you got to, Somebody's going to, they're going to buy toilet paper from somebody They might as well buy it from me is a lot different than a conceptual service like us as sales trainers and consultants where you're selling an intangible at a really high price, right? That, that, that's exactly right. Or, and, and you could look at like companies, like um, I made a mistake of hiring people from Salesforce or Oracle because they have that really cool resume, but guess what? They're the favorites. They're not underdogs. They don't have mm -hmm. that underdog mentality. Um, they have a lot of brand power that 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 they they that they, they, they didn't recognize. Um, I also look at who they sold to. Like if they were at Salesforce, they're probably selling to other salespeople. And Mike, I, I, I'll I'll be honest for myself. I'm an easy buy. I don't know about you. Salespeople are super easy to sell to. Yes, I've seen that from my father, who's been a Sandler trainer for 30 years, all the way up to the highest levels throughout our, our network of 400 trainers. Uh, salespeople love to buy. Yeah. Yeah. They love so to believe look, other salespeople too. Yeah. You know who's freaking hard to sell to? Engineers. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. I would much rather take a guy who has gone out and been successful selling to engineers even though that's not what my startup is doing because I know they know how to sell because they can go and do something that's very hard, which a startup is going to pre present those same challenges. Wow. You're hitting on a lot of really great stuff. Cause I can also see that what you mentioned earlier, the demand creation versus demand fulfillment and, and stuff if we're selling an unknown versus a known commodity. Or um, we talk a lot in our training about people that are aware of a problem. Sometimes you have to kind of create the awareness that they don't even know your solution exists. Uh, so they're not a solution aware, but they might not even be problem aware that that they have a problem that's a bottleneck in their organization or something. So especially in startups, I feel like that happens a lot where we're solving a problem people don't know they have or we have a new solution to a problem that they're not aware exists. And you do have to have those different conversations then. Like, again, like I said, they've been buying computers, networking services, or toilet paper for their whole life. They they know the problem. They know the solution to it. So those are really good. Now, I want to skip ahead a little bit because we got a lot to, to cover here. But I think as soon as you nail that hire or those first few hires and you get to, say, three, five salespeople, now you have the sales process problem where if you have two hires, if they're both doing it their own way, and like you said, they're, real, they're rock stars, they crush it. They just go out there and they sell. That's fine. But as soon as you get to like five salespeople, you can't have five different lone wolves out there doing it differently and selling different products or different structures and, and using different things. Otherwise, it becomes a mess. Uh, so tell us about this next stage. Yeah. So this is this is a crucial stage where now you have you have some traction. 
you want to figure out how to repeat it. And the only way, in, in my opinion, that you could repeat anything and ensure that you get the same results, and this, this goes back to the scientific method, is to have a process. Now, one of the challenges that I've seen at being a startup, and I see this with my colleagues who are still there, is that, oh man, and I, I, I feel like I'm going to sound a little hard on people, but not <laughs> no every, names, no names, yeah, Jason. No, no, but not every person understands actually what a sales process is, um, and so they they use what I call frameworks or staging. Um, so they've had their stages in Salesforce. And they're like, okay, we have a sales process or they have a mm -hmm. framework like, and I, and I don't know, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with this, Mike, Medic, MedPick, et cetera, right. which are great frameworks, but it's also not a sales process. And so one of the mistakes that I've seen made is that we confuse frameworks and staging for a process. We think we have something in place. We don't. And then, you know, you realize again, a year later, things aren't working and you can't now go back and figure out why because you don't have a process that's giving you consistent right. results. I'll zoom in even further on that because at Sandler, we talk a lot about our methodology, which is on top of that too. So the frameworks are great uh, because they kind of tell you what you're looking for. Um, but the process is the how, like, are we going to do a demo? Is there some sort of trial? Like how many meetings does it take to close? Like what, what does our proposal or presentation look like that's the how we get to a sale and then we have the sandler methodology about sort of why people are doing it and why these structures exist and uh, why people would qualify to move to the next stage of the sales process and that's completely different and you're right i, I think a lot of startups find one of those three and they think they've got it but they really don't until you have every step in the sales process laid out. And then you use those other frameworks to set up gates of why somebody would move to the next stage as a qualifying or disqualifying event, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, and so to take a technique, and, and I'd like to expand on something you mentioned a few minutes ago, which is that um, when you're a startup, you might have a solution that's new that people haven't really thought through. So if your sales process is that I'm just going to do a demo and I'm just going to show my features and benefits, um, that actually might not work because they don't really quite understand how those features and benefits impact them. So part of your sales process is building the right questions that you're going to ask at each of these stages to get them to understand the problems that they're trying to deal with. And then you can start to tie in those features and benefits on the demo to those. If you don't have that step in your process of really good question asking as one of your techniques, your demo is gonna fall flat. You're not gonna win as many deals as you should have. And again, you're gonna be a year late, uh, a year uh, looking back and be like, okay, what did we do wrong? I can't figure this out. Yeah, really good stuff there. So I, I think about, in this one, really nailing like uh, the right thing at the right time, right? So can we get all five people collecting best practices, sharing those within the team? We've got a, a 30 second commercial or prospecting process down. We've got in sale discovery process, all those questions. Now we've got closing and presentation and a standard deck people can use and, and pull slides. And we know what uh, solutioning looks like right there's a lot to build out here are there any others that jump out for you before we move on to the, the next stage i mean there's so many but i'd like to point out something that you just illustrated mike is that what you named off are not are, just, are, are a series of techniques but also a series of behaviors that each salesperson needs to execute every single time and so not only do you have to have a process, you also have to have a plan to measure each of those behaviors to ensure that all your reps are doing these things. Because again, if some are and some aren't, when you start to make sense of your data, you're not going to be able to come to any conclusions about what's working and not working. Yeah, you need these systems in place. They need to be educated and you need this common language, which brings us to stage number three. That's probably going to require some onboarding training. And especially as we get to the next stage of scale. So now we're moving from maybe five salespeople. If we want to scale up fast, it could be hundreds or thousands of salespeople that we work with here at Sandler. 
that's where you can uh, shameless plug, call a Sandler trainer and outsource it, but you better get your training and onboarding in place, right? That's right. And I learned this the hard way because <laughs> I didn't think about this until it was happening in real time. And when I was a CRO, I hired a Sandler trainer because I needed the problem fixed. So you're exactly right. But let me set the stage a little bit. So your first few hires, let's say one through five, they're going to learn the job mostly through osmosis. Like they're going to have a lot of access to the VP of sales. They're going to have a lot of access to the CEO. They, they're going to figure things out. Um, when I only had a few people working for me, I was watching all of their calls on Gong. I was giving them great feedback on Gong. I was dissecting everything that they're doing. As soon as I started to go from five to 10, then I started like listening to Gong calls on 2X because I couldn't get through them all. And maybe yeah. I just provide like a couple comments at the end. And then as I got more, it's like, okay, I'm just going to listen to it in the car. But now I'm not providing any feedback. And so the further that you get from your first five hires, they're not going to get that learning by osmosis. And if you're thinking, well, the first five people don't need any training. I don't need to do it for the next five or 10. You're going to be dead wrong. You're going to get a bunch of salespeople. They don't know what they're doing. Nobody's speaking the right language. People are missing numbers. They're losing confidence, and you're going to be in a mess. So I feel like this is really where we can talk about how Sandler solves these and some of the stuff that that we train because uh, it gets overly complicated here, but it can also be pretty simple that we have to measure some of those deficiencies. We need assessments and benchmarking to find out what is the, the process? What are our best salespeople doing? What do we need to replicate uh, our new hires as we scale up? And again, if they're 5, 10, 20 at a time, 100 at a time, how can we sort of measure, find their individual gaps and then close them is a big different challenge. And then uh, also adding in sales coaching. So we're going to have to, if we have 100 salespeople, now we have layers of sales management and hire managers, which is also a completely different challenge. And usually they get under supported, especially in startups, right? You're hundred percent right. So a few things there um, working backwards. So like the sales coaching, most VPs that I've been around um, or even CEOs, if they're running the, the, the sales team directly are good at coaching. Um, they've had good coaching in the past. They know how to replicate it. But sales managers who you're who are now doing the coaching don't really have the experience of coaching, and they're not very good at it. They're good at what I'd call asking check the box questions. Have you met with this person? Have you done this? Have you done this? And they can help you there, or they can help with closing. Like if you bring them on a call, I can help you close. But they don't really know how to provide coaching, um, and so the sales team doesn't really grow at the rate it should be given how the organization is growing numerically to keep up with the, with their revenue goals. The second thing, Mike, that you said is that um, going back to my science experiment analogy, when you're now having 10 or 20 people, there are so many variables going on. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not uncommon for a VP to call me and be like, I don't know why my win rate's going down and I don't know why. They no longer know the root calls. And one of the things that's great about Sandler is that the trainers have been trained on how to find that root cause, using assessments, using interviews, asking the right questions, so they can help the VP find here's the actual cause and train to it rather than just taking a guess and kind of like, oh, let's just do a workshop and hope it works. Yeah, deal analytics come to mind there too. So we have some some tools uh, for that that you can ask your Sandler trainer about. But could, they know to look in the the CRM and look for what and where the bottlenecks are and what's causing problems. So um, most people, I feel like, default to we're not putting enough in the top of the funnel. Sandler trainers look at the whole thing and they're like, oh no, actually, you know, you're at like a 15 to 20% close rate on proposals, something is happening that you're not qualifying hard enough uh, at the end, or you're not winning enough of these deals at the end of the process. Um, and it really takes some hard work sometimes to diagnose what those problems are for each individual or territory or product line as you scale up. Yep. That's exactly right. And to, and to my previous point, um, 
if you don't narrow, narrow if you don't nail the variables, like all you do is go six or nine or 12 months without making any progress. You don't learn anything. And that's the worst place to be as a startup. So I feel like we've covered a lot here, but I wanted to give you one more shot. Are there any attitudes, behaviors, and, and techniques that you think we've missed here? Or how can we tie it all together and, and wrap it up for everybody? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, 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 I would throw in one other hiring technique that I failed to mention at the beginning, which is whenever you make your first sales hire, hire two people. Again, <laughs> it eliminates variables. Um, if, if both aren't working out, you know you have a problem internally. If uh, one's working out and one's not, you know you have a, a personnel issue. Um, were you, I'm sorry. Good. I was going to jump in. A, a couple more hiring tips uh, that I like is, one, have your Sandler trainer interview them because you fall in love with them and you know your process, but they can really look at will they sell, uh, can they sell, and will they actually sell for your company. The The second one for me is, I disqualify hard because you can turn down a lot of really good salespeople as long as you hire somebody that does sell, but you don't want a false positive, somebody you think can sell that doesn't. So if you go really hard and you turn down somebody that's like, oh, this person's like a 9.5. If you turn down a 9.5 on a 10 scale, that's okay. So long as you hire a 10. If, that's you, right. if you hire a four, that doesn't work. Should have gone the other way. But you can be really hard and make them go through a lot of hoops and, you know, and, and then you can even overpay if you're getting somebody that is really great. But all of those other challenges come from if you hire somebody that doesn't end up selling. That's right. I, I feel like founders, owners, VPs of sales, when they're at a stage, have a little bit of head trash when it comes to hiring. I need to find the first warm body that wants to work for me. Nobody's going to want to work <laughs> for me, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I believe they couldn't be more dead wrong. Um, people want to work for good managers. They want to work for good companies. They want to be a part of something big. Um, I know when I took a, my job at a first startup, I took a lower base than what I was making before because I wanted to be in that environment. And so it doesn't always come down to money or competing with the big folks. Sell them on the vision. Sell them on who you are. Sell them how you're going to help them grow. And you'll be able to get high quality people. Love that. Great stuff. Again, we're talking with Jason Kelligan, Sandler Trainer from San Francisco, about how to succeed at startups this week. Jason, I wanted to get to know you a little bit better here, too. So at this point in your career, how do you define success for yourself? Yeah, so I don't have a, a fancy definition of success. Success to me is just, uh, you know, did I accomplish what I tended to accomplish? Um I think about it with, you know, sports. If your intention is to win a championship or win MVP or to finish first place, um, success is did you accomplish it? Um, it's easy to measure. It's easy to find. But you, the, the, the key part is being intentional about what you're trying to do. Yeah, I've found myself doing that a lot with public speaking these days that, that I judge myself on. Did I do the performance I had envisioned in my mind? I can't control the audience's reaction or the other situation or the tech variables or things like that. But I can control of did I do what I set out to do, right? And and judge internally rather than external responses or reviews or whatever happened to, to come my way. What about the flip side of the question? Was there a, a biggest failure in your career you're most proud of or a particularly hard lesson learned that you got over that you're proud of? Yeah, you know, like I said, I made a number of mistakes in startups. Um, one that uh, got me fired, which <laughs> is that I was um, I was too optimistic about my forecast, and I painted a rosier picture of the future than what uh, than what really happened, and the board wasn't too happy about that. And so I learned from that lesson to ask better questions, to be much more skeptical about what my team's telling me and to be much more honest about what the future is because at a certain level people don't want to hear what what you think they they don't want to hear they want to hear the truth they don't want to hear a rosy picture of the future that's not true and i learned that the hard way it's a great lesson uh to learn though It'll serve you for the rest of your career there for sure do you have a favorite sandler rule concept or uh quote yeah, so my favorite rule is that the problem that the prospect brings you 
is not the real problem. Um, it's a hundred percent true. It's probably also true for therapists when they, when they talk to somebody, but you have to ask the right questions to get them to t- tell you what the real problem is. Yeah, that's a, a big one. And I think that happens a lot, especially in, in startups where we already mentioned that they might not know the problem. They might be lying to you about the problem. People might be telling you that your solution's great because they see you're all excited about your startup and they're not telling you the real problems uh, behind it or, or in the implementation and stuff. There's a lot that you have to dig into and, and get to the next level. So uh, good stuff today. Jason, anything else uh, that you wanted to share or how people can can work with you? If you're gonna encourage a, a startup to reach out to a Sandler trainer, what would you say? Yeah, well, if you're in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, um, love to speak with you. And so you could find me at kelligan.sandler.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, a uh, number of ways you could get a hold of me. Um, for folks outside the Bay Area, there are tons of great Sandler trainers. Go online, find the one in your area, and set up a conversation. You bet. Just go to Sandler.com, and you can find, click on Find a Training Location. There's still good lessons along the way, and we have an enterprise team that can help you with those big uh, international contracts or uh, multi-location uh, businesses as well. That's always super fun. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast in your favorite app, share it with somebody that you think needs to hear it or uh, reach out to us. If you have any ideas for future guests and topics, always looking for those. Thank you for listening. Whatever you are, be a good one. See you everybody. Bye.